The quokka and the quoll belong to Australia's most famous family of animals, the pouched marsupials. They come in every variety. Grass grazers, leaf munchers, and meat eaters. Two of the smallest members of the family reveal their biggest differences. The quoll is an independent, mighty hunter and carnivore to the core. The smaller, more sociable quokka lives in groups and has a charming disposition. Both are rare, but while one is shy and elusive, the other lives happily in public view. They're both native to Australia, living in the forests and islands of this vast ancient continent. Home to some of the planet's most unusual and fascinating animals. These are the secret lives of mini marsupials. Nineteen kilometres off the coast of Perth in Western Australia lies the sunny island of Rocknest. Just over 18 square kilometres of limestone is covered with sand and vegetation. With less rainfall than the nearby mainland, it enjoys a hospitable climate of warm winters and cool summers. It's an ideal habitat for many creatures and has abundant bird life. Playful sea lions abound in its coastal waters. There's another animal that lives here, one that's the island's most celebrated inhabitant. The quokka. This pocket-sized, nocturnal marsupial is around 40 to 50 centimetres long, with a tail two-thirds as long again. An adult weighs between two and a half and five kilos, so they're around the size and weight of a domestic cat. With bright eyes, short, dense brown-grey fur, small forelimbs, and hopping hind legs. This is one of the smallest of the wallabies, cousin to the kangaroo. Although the eastern grey kangaroo is four times taller than the quokka, and around 14 times heavier. Kangaroo legs are muscly and powerful, while the quokka's hindquarters, having to move a far lighter load, are much slighter. But it's easy to see the family resemblance when they're hopping. It's an efficient means of traversing Australia's often rough, broken terrain, sometimes at high speed. A kangaroo can easily reach 64 kilometres per hour, while the quokka manages a much more leisurely 12 kilometres an hour. The kangaroo's thick, muscly tail can act as a third leg. It helps to keep its balance while grazing. The quokka's tail is much thinner. But like the kangaroo's, functions as a counterbalance when going at full speed. There are between 8 and 12,000 quokkas living on rock nest. In the wilder places of the island, and right next to the human inhabitants. 
They like to hang out in the swampy areas near the island's natural salt lakes. The heathland offers them access to the grasses and plants they eat. For the charismatic quokka, life on rock nest offers more than just food. It also provides protection. As a small, defenceless, ground-based mammal, the quokka would normally be a tasty morsel for any predator. On the mainland, it is. But on rock nest, the quokkas can relax. There are no predators here. Quokkas are endemic to southwest Australia and used to have healthy populations on the mainland until the introduction of the red fox from Europe in the 1800s. Since then, foxes as well as domestic cats have decimated quokka numbers on the mainland. They've suffered massive population loss and they're listed as vulnerable. But Rottnest Island separated from the mainland around six and a half thousand years ago due to rising sea levels. Foxes and feral cats never made it here, so quokkas have evolved with no natural predators. And now, pet cats and dogs aren't allowed. There's a kind of snake on the island, the dugite. But this venomous reptile usually only reaches around a meter in length. Too small to swallow the quokkas. As a result, the island's quokkas have been free to build up their population base. But their lack of predation also means their natural fear levels have reduced. And they're quite happy to coexist with the human islanders. It's getting towards sunset, and the quokkas prepare to leave the coolness of the shady spots they rest in during the daytime. Feeding begins in earnest as the day draws to a close. They're foraging herbivores and browse in family groups on grasses, succulents and the leaves of shrubs. The females feed with their young, known as joeys. A little grooming reinforces family ties. It also helps prevent parasites like ticks. As the light finally fades, they start to move further afield in search of more plentiful feeding grounds. Thousands of miles away from Rottnest, on the eastern coast of the mainland, another of Australia's marsupials is also looking for food. But this is no sweet-natured vegetarian. This is the quoll. 
There are four kinds of quoll living in Australia. All are endangered. Of these, the spotted tail or tiger quoll is the biggest at around five kilos. It's the only one with spots running all the way down onto its tail. It's the largest carnivorous marsupial that still exists on the Australian mainland. It inhabits the eastern coastal regions from South Queensland in the north down to Tasmania in the south. In stark contrast to the social quokka, the spotted tail quoll lives alone, except for the mating season. It prefers the wildest reaches of the wet forests with good levels of moisture, lots of dense cover and plenty of prey. With densely packed muscle, keen edged claws, and very sharp teeth. The semi-arboreal tiger quoll is a consummate killer. It goes after rodents, lizards, snakes, birds, rabbits and even much larger prey like wallabies. Quolls are very much at home in the trees. Expert climbers, they spend a lot of time traversing tricky branches with their superb balance. And they're amazing jumpers. Every nook and cranny of every piece of bark may hold a tasty insect treat. And the quoll will exploit every potential food source, no matter how small. Anything entering the quoll's territory is fair game. This rat is a prime target for the resident quoll, a female. Sharp eyesight, acute hearing, and a great sense of smell all combine to make this stalk and pounce specialist an efficient hunter. She has a carnivore's long, curved canines, good for delivering a lethal bite to the head or neck. Her other teeth are designed for shearing through flesh, and the rat is quickly dispatched. She has another hunting weapon, her whiskers or vibrissi. She can put her face down into a prey animal's burrow and use her whiskers to detect movement. It all combines to form a truly formidable predator.
back on Rotnest Island, the resident herbivore marsupials, the quokkas, are feeding together. Although the quokkas live communally, they do have some rules about personal space. They like to keep a certain area around them free of other quokkas. They have a comfort zone of around a metre. And if anyone gets too close, they'll make an exit. Every day, their mission is to get their quota of nutrients and moisture. The freshwater supply on the island is limited, and the standing water is salty. So the quokkas don't drink it. They must find their moisture elsewhere. This young mother is enjoying some water droplets straight from the grass. But quokkas get most of their moisture from food. The quokkas will feed on plants with high water content, favouring the fresh, juicy new growth. Getting enough nutrition from plant material is always a challenge for herbivores. Plant material is tough and fibrous and can be difficult to digest. To help them, quokkas share some characteristics with ruminants such as cattle and sheep. They have a chambered stomach which breaks down the plants. Then they chew the cud. Regurgitating food they've recently swallowed remasticating it, then swallowing it again for final digestion. This male has a preference for flowers. He gently sorts and snuffles his way through the ants to find his favourite foodstuff. Even without predators, these pint-sized marsupials can struggle to survive. Every year it's a race against time to build up body reserves. Australian summertime, December to March, is dry with little rainfall. To get enough moisture, the quokkas eat plants that have a high water content, but are low in nutrition. But towards the end of the summer, the quokkas must start to seek out high nutrition plants to build fat reserves for the upcoming winter. But they still need to get moisture from their food, so they must strike a balance. If they get this delicate mix wrong, they could get sick and susceptible to viruses. Fall is when many quokkas will perish. Those that do survive through to winter, when there's more rainfall, can shift to eating high nutrition plants. But many will never get the chance to make the switch. So although they're not particularly territorial, they will protect good areas of grazing. This quokka wants to make sure he gets prolonged access to this patch of juicy young grass. And his rival has to hop it.
As they feed throughout the night, many of the quokkas will stay on the island's scrubby heathland. Others travel to different feeding areas. They use the island's networks of trails, paths and even roads. They make their way closer and closer to bright lights, which leads them to where the people are. Some already live cheek by jowl with people and include human habitats as part of their nightly feeding range. Like this suburban street. to hopping the pavement and they're not phased at all by human hustle and bustle. In fact, it takes a helicopter lifting off nearby to finally get them to take to their heels. Many like to graze around the old army barracks. Although they're happy to move around and feed during parts of the day, the quokka is mainly nocturnal. But it seems some of the youngsters find all this nightlife a bit tiring. first light, the quokkas start moving back towards their shelter areas, away from people, in the undergrowth and shrub coverage. For a quokka, these daytime resting spots are extremely important. Quokka's small size has made them masters of the undergrowth. And their rest areas tend to be short tunnels they make out of dense vegetation. These provide cover and, crucially, shade from the heat of the sun while they nap. On hot days, the adult males will fight for possession of the best spots. For now, it's time to snuggle up and snooze the day away. The carnivorous quoll also likes to spend some of the day sleeping, although if feeding opportunities arise in the daytime, the quoll will take them. As well as being a superb hunter, it's also an opportunistic feeder.
carrion will be on the menu when she can get it, as well as whatever she can find whilst traversing her large range of over 600 hectares. A railbird has left its eggs unattended, relying on the nest's camouflage while it goes foraging. Rails make their nests in tussocky grass on the ground. The eggs are in the territory of this male quoll, and he has an incredible sense of smell. Males are generally bigger and stockier than the females, and have even larger territories. He has no intention of sharing. The railbird may be distressed, but there's nothing it can do. Eggs are a staple food for the quoll and are an important source of nutrition. He's wiped out the nest, but he can smell something else. And he's going after it. Nearby, a pair of galahs, part of the cockatoo family, raise the alarm. Unlike the railbird, these cockatoos make their nests up in the trees. And this pair also has a nest full of eggs nearby. They aren't safe from the quoll. A climb like this is child's play to him. His foot pads extend all the way up to his wrist and heel joints. And they're ridged, a perfect adaptation for gripping onto trees. His sharp, cat-like claws act like crampons. His keen sense of smell is telling him he's still on the right track for the eggs, but something distracts him. He comes across some insects underneath the bark of the tree. And this easy meal seems to sate him, for now. This time, the galahs get to keep their eggs. Back on Rotnest Island, the quokkas are busy feeding.
The quokka and the quoll are very different animals, but both are marsupials, creatures with pouches for raising their young. This joey is a few months old, but marsupials give birth to extremely underdeveloped young. They're usually born around the size of a lentil, or in larger animals like kangaroos, a jelly bean, and they crawl to the pouch where they continue to grow, unlike placental mammals, which are born fully developed. Some pouches face backwards, like the wombats. These burrowing marsupials spend much of their time digging, so a backwards-facing pouch ensures it doesn't fill up with earth. Kangaroo pouches are perhaps the best known to humans. Powerful sphincter-like muscles keep babies safe inside until it's old enough to become more independent. But the short period in the womb versus the relatively long time spent developing in the pouch is one of the defining characteristics of marsupials. And Australia has more of them than anywhere else in the world. Fossil finds suggest the first marsupial originated around 125 million years ago in what is now China, but then was part of the ancient supercontinent, Laurasia. It's thought these early marsupials dispersed south into the other supercontinent of the time, Gondwana. This landmass contained what would become the Americas, Antarctica and Australia. When Gondwana began to split up, around 45 to 50 million years ago, Australia broke away and started drifting north, taking its now isolated marsupials with it. Some were left behind, mainly in South America, but most marsupials were in Australia. As Australia drifted north, it didn't experience major glaciation, earthquakes or volcanic activity. Without these to churn up and renew the earth, the soil remained relatively poor quality. This favoured the marsupials, whose metabolic rate is around 30% lower than placental mammals, meaning they need to consume a lot less energy to live. With little competition from placental mammals, the marsupials thrived and diversified in their brand new continent. Today though, some of the remaining marsupials are having a harder time. While the bigger members of the family, like the kangaroos, have healthy populations, their smaller cousins are struggling. This rabbit-sized marsupial, the betong, once widespread over the continent, now survives in small, fragmented populations. Its preferred habitat is eucalyptus forest and grassy woodlands, just the type of land that gets cleared for human development. Even though it's capable of producing three young a year, it can't keep up with habitat loss combined with predation from non-native foxes and cats.
The Tasmanian devil, feisty and pugilistic, has also been no match for disease, habitat loss and road accidents. Its numbers are now so low that experts are worried about the lack of genetic diversity among the survivors. Quolls have also had their numbers massively reduced by habitat destruction and poison that is left out for foxes and dingoes. Quokka and quoll numbers are both considered threatened and quolls are nationally designated as endangered. Unlike the quokkas of Rottnest, quolls don't have the luxury of a protected island and are especially at risk from one of Australia's biggest killers of native wildlife. The cane toad. This large amphibian was introduced in 1935 from its native South and Central America. It was brought in as a means of controlling pest beetles in one of Australia's most important crops, sugarcane. Not only did it fail to do this, it went on to have a catastrophic impact on the resident animal population. The cane toad looks like an easy snack for a hungry carnivore but it exudes poison from glands all over its upper surface that will kill almost anything that tries to eat it. If one dies near a water source, it will contaminate the water, which will then go on to poison any animal that drinks it. Its introduction has been a disaster, and its populations are spreading fast all over the country. Carnivores like quolls have been particularly affected. Amphibians are part of their normal diet, so they unsuspectingly eat cane toads. And there's another introduced species that's also helping cause the quoll's demise. At just the size and weight of an average cat, the quolls are no match for the voracious fox. Beneath their fiery exterior, there's an animal in very real danger of extinction. Quolls need their environment to be just right. They typically choose habitat that gets over 600 millimetres of rain a year. They need the area to have good nest sites, like fallen logs, small caves or rock crevices. And their hunting range needs around 80% dense cover so they can forage for and stalk their prey. Overhead cover from a canopy is important as well. If half of this vegetation is removed, all the resident quolls will move out of an area. This leaves them especially vulnerable to land being cleared by humans for development. Their slow population growth doesn't help their situation. Female tiger quolls only become sexually mature at age two and die at around age five, probably only having around 12 babies over their lifetime. This female quoll has three babies this year. Both male and female quolls mate with multiple partners throughout the winter breeding season, and these babies have different fathers. This is called superfecundation. It occurs when separate eggs in the same ovulatory cycle are fertilized by different fathers. It's common in cats and dogs, and possible, but rare, in humans. These babies, or joeys, are 10 weeks old. Like all marsupials, she had a short gestation period, 21 days and gave birth to very underdeveloped, blind young. They had to perform a mammoth crawl from the birth canal up to mum's pouch to reach a teat and safety. Because of this marathon journey to the pouch, most marsupial babies are born with well-developed forelimbs despite their tiny size. This enables them to hold on to their mother's fur. They also have well-defined nostrils and mouth for breathing while feeding. 
Other body parts, like hind limbs, can wait to take more shape later on, once they're safely inside the pouch. Weeks later, the babies have developed thicker, denser fur and better eyesight. They're becoming more independent. Now they get left in the cosy den when mum goes out to hunt. In another month, Mum will become more and more aggressive to them as a hint that it's time for them to leave the den and make their own way in the world. The quokkas, back on Rotnest Island, also have a slow reproduction rate. They reach sexual maturity at about 18 months and produce just one baby a year for around eight or nine years. So while a quoll may manage around 12 babies over her lifetime, the quokka will produce fewer than 10. The female keeps her baby in the pouch for around six months. After that, it will leave periodically, but continue to feed from the teats inside Mum's pouch for another two months. Right now, this quokka female is looking after this year's young, who's around eight or nine months old. He's now what's called at foot, and is testing out his independence by exploring farther away for longer periods. He realises how far away he's strayed and starts back. If something does happen to her son, the female quokka has a reproductive backup strategy, embryonic diapause. The female quokka will mate again just one day after her baby is born. But the new embryo will stay dormant inside her. If the original baby lives, then the embryo simply degenerates. But if the baby dies within five months, the dormant embryo resumes development and is born between 24 and 27 days later. Quokkas and quolls are tenacious survivors. Whether they're dealing with habitat destruction, predation, or getting enough nutrition, survival is a constant challenge. They may be diminutive, but Australia's mini marsupials are a stunning snapshot of what makes the continent's wildlife so special. 
whether it's a pint-sized predator with formidable hunting skills, a lovable herbivore, or any other example of these extraordinary pouched mammals. They're an important part of Australia's vibrant animal landscape.